with us with the latest coming in from Europe as the European Commission has now proposed new rules to grant the Euro European Union the power to declare a health emergency. Under the proposal, the EU would be able to declare public health emergency on its level in order to ensure more coordination among EU states. The 27 EU governments have had an uncoordinated reaction to the pandemic. Currently, the EU relies on the World Health Organization to declare such an emergency. In a statement, the EU said that the new rules will enable the activation of EU emergency response mechanisms without making it contingent upon the WHO's own declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. The implementation would be followed by a structural overhaul that would partly take away a major power from the WHO. The WHO has been criticized for declaring coronavirus outbreak as a pandemic too late. The UN agency has repeatedly denied the accusation, though. US President Donald Trump has also called the organization a puppet of China. A top EU lawmaker, Peter Lies said, and I quote, we relied too much on the WHO for the COVID-19 pandemic. Under pressure from China, the WHO declared the health emergency too late. It is therefore important to have the possibility to act at European level in future similar situations. Now, there are more than 52 million cases of COVID-19 around the world. More than 1 million people have succumbed to the virus. The death toll in Europe alone is set to surpass 300,000 mark. Authorities fear that despite hopes for a new vaccine, fatalities and infections will continue to rise as the winter season approaches. And for more details, let's quickly go across to our correspondent, Lucy Huff, who is joining us live from Brussels at this hour. Lucy, thank you so much for joining our broadcast. Now that the EU is taking charge of an emergency response mechanism by not depending on the WHO, what does this speak of the WHO's role so far since they were too late in declaring the pandemic? Well, yes, as you say, this is something of a, a blow to the WHO, which was criticized in the early stages of this pandemic for failing to declare it in enough time with allegations that the WHO had been under pressure from China not to declare a pandemic. So uh, what we saw here in Europe was a slightly chaotic and uncoordinated response in that early stage. So what these new proposals would do is enable the EU to declare a pandemic on its own and to test national preparedness plans for that scenario. And that comes after a scenario at the beginning of, of all of this uh, health crisis where we had uh, countries closing their borders and in a haphazard way there was a failure to coordinate on the, the uh, procurement of specialist equipment and medical uh, gear such as personal protective equipment. So this would allow the EU to kickstart that process by itself, but it insists that it would work with the WHO uh, on this, that it wouldn't be looking to undermine the WHO and that it would be involved in that process. But nonetheless, it would give the EU more power right. to declare a health emergency by itself. Right, Lucy. And since Europe has been gripped by a second wave, what are the viable options left for Europe to battle the shortage of beds and doctors? How practical are stringent lockdowns as a solution? Well, we are seeing lockdowns now in place across much of Europe, millions of European citizens under second lockdowns. Uh, the most strict measures we're seeing are in France, where we know the health system was under enormous pressure. Here in Belgium, Belgium was for some time the worst affected country in Europe. We had a warning that the ICU beds could have been full by this point, by the middle of November, if the second wave was allowed to continue at the rate that it was. But with uh, national lockdowns being reimposed around a fortnight ago across much of Europe, we are seeing those numbers start to fall, particularly here in Belgium, where we're seeing case numbers now under 8,000 a day, down from 22,000 at the end of October, and the pressure on the healthcare system starting to wane, although we do have some uh, 1,500 people in ICU wards at the moment. So there are indications that the second lockdown is working, that the, the strict measures to close down hospital sectors, to make home working mandatory, and uh, other measures in place to do with face masks are having an impact and of course we know with this uh, news about the vaccine we are right. seeing at a centralized level here in Europe uh, pr the procurement of, of mass numbers of vaccines some 300 million vaccines right. uh, from the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine bought right. by the EU uh, in a deal signed yesterday.
It's interesting that you mentioned the vaccines, and th that's exactly what I was coming to, because, Lucy, going by their unprecedented speed of trials, what do you make of the efficacy of these vaccines, especially those by Sputnik V or even Pfizer and BioNTech, and what are the, the roadblocks ahead? Well, there are enormous challenges, not least logistical challenges, uh, once this uh, vaccine, if should it become available on the market. And we know, of course, that uh, the early trials have shown that it is 90 percent effective, but that there are still uh, further checks that need to be done before it can be put on the market. But we are expecting uh, some people to be able to be vaccinated in Europe by the end of this year. And certainly the EU Commission uh, is working to, to ensure that that will become possible. We know also that the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine will be declaring its results uh, within the next couple of weeks as well. So. Uh, with regards to the Sputnik vaccine, uh, there is, as you say, some skepticism because uh, Russia is not making the data from those trials available. It says that the vaccine is 92 percent effective. Uh, but without health authorities here being able to look at that data, uh, there will be some skepticism about making that vaccine widely available on the market. But certainly from the EU side, it believes that it will have a vaccine uh, available by spring 2021. It has purchased uh, 300 million doses of the vaccine, which would uh, be able to be given to some 150 million people across Europe with uh, two doses needed of this particular vaccine. So uh, certainly the EU is hoping for a mass vaccination program to start from spring 2021 and therefore allow some sense of normality to, to resume uh, across the continent. Absolutely. And here's hoping that these vaccines are able to convince the authorities and the people as far as their efficacy is also concerned. Thank you so much, Lucy, for bringing us all those details.